Okay, everybody, good afternoon. Uh, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Bobby Smith. I am your fire chief here in Fairfield Glade. And um, this is not my show. I'm a firefighter, but I'm not one of this fire type of firefighting. So we brought in the big experts. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce to you Steve Smith. Steve Smith, as you know, was the president of the board of uh, Fairfield Glade. And he is going to take it from here. So I will end up with some comments at the very end. Steve. Thank you. Uh, as Bobby mentioned, my name is Steve Smith. Uh, I'm a member of the Board of Directors. Um, we have created, or we have a newly created, excuse me, I have to get my glasses or I can't read their names, um, Firewise Committee. Um, I'll explain what that is in a minute. Uh, the members of the committee, if you'd stand, uh, John Hufford, is he here? Uh, John Wedworth. Uh, Mike Turner, Bobby Smith, obviously, uh, Bruce Pilant, who is the uh, fire safety officer, couldn't make it, he's in training today, uh, Manuel Marty, uh, myself, Steve Smith, uh, our fire, our police chief, Mike Williams, and Sam McAdoo, I don't think Sam, Mike and Sam are both our uh, uh, SMT liaisons to the committee. Uh, what happened is several years ago, we had two things take place here in the Glade. Uh, if you were here, you remember our ice storm. And then uh, a couple years back, we had a series of uh, a real drought where we had a series of uh, wildfires or fires being lit in Catoosa and so on and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, that was the same year, I believe, that we had the disaster in Gatlinburg. And uh, things with, like natural disasters, one of the things is that when they take place, First of all, we never think that a natural disaster is going to happen to us. We think it's going to happen somewhere else. Um, then when it does happen to us, we get very excited about it, we get very nervous about it, and we begin to plan after the fact. Well, what happened is uh, Bobby and the fire department came to the board this year, and they said, you know, uh, in reality, why don't we try to be proactive instead of reactive? Why don't we do something now ahead of the time, ahead of the problem? And so what we decided to do uh, is we decided to uh, create this Wildfire Smart Committee and Wildfire Smart Program. Now there is a Wildfire Wise, is that the Fire, Fire Wise Program that is certified by the state. Uh, and uh, we may eventually end up going down that road seeking state certification, but we thought uh, to get started, that we, we start this way. So what we're doing is we've already put out a couple e-blasts about uh, uh, being smart about wildfires. Uh, we're holding this town hall meeting. Uh, we will hold periodic ho town hall meetings from here on. Um, and uh, basically, it's just an educational program that uh, we hope will benefit the community. So that's where we're at. Uh, I will introduce... Uh, we have three people here, three experts here with us today. We have uh, Dave uh, Filiro Fil Filroa, excuse me, uh, who is a private contractor to assist uh, Tennessee divisions of forestry to implement wild fire land hazard programs with fire departments, committees, or communities, and uh, citizens of Tennessee. Then we've got Jim Dale who is the Assistant District Forester for Cumberland District. And then we have uh, Donnie Sh Shula, who is a battalion chief from Sevierville Fire Department. And uh, we all know what those folks went through. So we appreciate the three of these guys being here. Uh, it's their program. They're going to run it. Uh, we'll have a uh, question and answer period afterwards. Uh, there's some brochures in the back as you leave. Uh, if you'd stop by and pick those up, and I'll turn the meeting over to the experts. Thank you. That's who we are right there. We're still on. Okay. First of all, thank you for this excellent turnout today. We're uh, we're uh, very appreciative of the opportunity to come and be with you uh, today. It's your, your invitation. I uh, look out across the crowd and I see a number of uh, fire department personnel and 
and police and other other agencies and we're glad that you're here with us as well. Dave and I have a few years of uh, <clears throat> wildland fire experience. Dave served for 30 years on the San Bernardino National Forest in California with the U.S. Forest Service. I've just started my 42nd year with the Division of Forestry, so I guess we like what we do, Dave. Been in it for a long time, so we're we have a keen interest in uh, community wildfire protection, and so we hope that what we present to you today will be of be of interest to you. Before we get into my brief, and I'm going to be very brief in my section here, I want to just show you some stats. <clears throat> that were generated by the Southeastern United States uh, Coordination Center. Across the country we have, in the, in the wildland fire world, we have what we call geographic area coordination centers. <clears throat> Ours in Tennessee, Fort Tennessee, happens to be in Atlanta. So periodically we, we uh, get stats from them and we work with them on a regular basis in various functions. But through November the 4th, I know we've uh, been aware of what's been going on in California here in recent weeks. And I want to show you some stats for the southeastern states. This is for calendar year January 1 through November 4th. I want you to understand the magnitude of the numbers that we're looking at. Through November 4th in the southeast, there have been 19,098 human-caused fires. Uh, and how do we classify human-caused? What are some of the human causes? Careless debris burning, that ugly word called incendiary with malicious intent. <clears throat> and then we have other things like um, fireworks, faulty equipment. We have all kinds of things. But most of the fires that we have are human caused. <clears throat> and of that number, 313,000 and some odd acres there have burned thus far this year. <clears throat> Lightning fires, 836. Lightning caused burned acres, a little over 138,000. And then total fires. These do not include <clears throat> acres that we have uh, burned under management plans called prescribed burning for fuels reduction. <clears throat> 19,934 thus far. <clears throat> and if I get to Crouppen here, just bear with me. I've been battling bronchitis. 451,000 acres plus some thus far this year. I want to just briefly cover some terms that you may hear here today. Uh, first of all, hazard mitigation. We're going to discuss that a little bit. I'll briefly touch on it, and then Dave can we'll, we'll follow up on that. Community preparedness. Risk reduction, community wildfire protection plans, defensible space, structural ignition, and then FireWise USA and fire adapted communities. And then we will we'll briefly mention the wildland urban interface. What is it? Okay. <clears throat> Hazard mitigation is the effort that we put forth to reduce the loss of life and property by reducing the potential impact of disasters. It's a very concise statement. That's what we do. There are three things that influence the behavior of wildland fires the most, and we have entire training courses that we conduct for fire departments and community groups, which really go more in depth as to why wildland fires act the way they do. <clears throat> but the three most important influences are weather, topography, 
and fuels. Now, <clears throat> which of these do we have the opportunity to mitigate? Right, okay. We can do something about the fuels. We can't do one single thing about the weather. We can't alter the topography of the land uh, in broad scale. So we can do something about fuels, wherever they may be. This is not a very good slide, but I wanted to just show it to you and let you see a structure that survived. <clears throat> no trees in the yard. <clears throat> does not mean those trees would not have been welcomed, I'm sure. But the fire was a low-intensity fire, burned through the grass, went up to the edge of the house and went out. No doubt, um, fire department on the scene and, and provided some suppression efforts there as well. And one of the things that we want to remember today is that there are some things that we can do ourselves to reduce the hazards around our homes and we can do some mitigation work ourselves. okay? Back in one of the rough fire years in the past, I had a former district forester who made this statement. Everything was just burning up that year. We were having lots of, lots of fires. It seems as though it was around 1986. But he's retired now, but this, uh, this statement I think adequately reflects um, the feeling of many of us. And he said, there's simply not enough fire equipment, whether structural or wildland, to position at every home or structure. Homeowners can do some simple things to help protect themselves and their property. Outstanding statement, I think. We'll look forward to answering questions a little later on, so as not to uh, belabor the, the program here. I'm going to call Dave Fiorella. Well, it's certainly a good turnout. Very, very happy to see all you all out here. And uh, my name is David Fiorello, and I have worked in Southern California on the San Bernardino National Forest for quite a few years. And it, you've seen a, a lot of the news lately, well, what's going on in California. And from a firefighter standpoint, it's nothing more bewildering to have whole communities being overrun with these catastrophic fires, not, not counting the misery that the residents go through. But as a professional firefighter, you just, there's not really a lot you can do when it gets into that phase, that t type of mode where it's going house to house structures and, the, and there's so much fuel and there's so much flying embers from high wind events. There's not a lot you can do. You take a lot of pride in being a professional firefighter and being able to, to do things out there, but really it gets handed to you and it's a very difficult thing but there are things we can do in the forefront we talk about that's what chief was talking about proactive <laughs> back here I, we're talking about proactive being doing things up front and that's what we're talking about but we want to just introduce some programs and i will commend you on what you're doing and the programs you're starting and we'll kind of talk about how you might be able to interface with the with the recognized programs that the Division of Forestry promotes and the uh, NFPA and, and the United States Forest Service and the other land management agencies. But wildfires have always been part of Tennessee history. They've been burning in prehistoric times, mostly caused by lightning. You know, most of our lightning strikes don't cause fires, but the climate's been different over the years. And you get lightning fires all over the place. and they. They'll tend to meander, and in the prehistoric times, that's what kept the forest floors clear. Native Americans used fire to benefit wildlife, keeping the forests open for ease of travel, hunting, and keeping unwanted vegetation out. Then the European settlers used fire to help keep the landscape clear. In about 1910, 
The land, you know, forestry was just getting started in this country. We, were no, we realized there was a need to manage the forest and take care of the forest. And at that time, forestry, foresters thought fire was bad. And we had a series of events in the northwestern, north, northwestern United States, and it led to the big blow up of 1910, where three million acres burned in, in a short period of time, and hundreds of people died. Well, there kind of was a, drew a line in the sand, so to speak, and the U.S. Forest Service implemented a policy called the 10 o'clock policy, where any fire that started, they would be put under control. The goal was to control it by 10 o'clock the next day. Okay? Got very good at it. When I worked for the Forest Service, we were good at it. We can catch fires most of the time and put them out. There was just a, and it's still that way. We can catch unwanted fires and extinguish 98% of them relatively quickly. But as a byproduct of that, forest fuel started building up because it wasn't burning anymore. And then we had people moving into these areas where they didn't live before. And so you had homes where the wildland vegetation is, and so you can't let them burn. So you have to do prescribed burning and stuff, but you've got to manage it very closely. And so you live in a beautiful area, but it's, there's fires prone to this area. But we, we need to manage that wildfire and when we live in that urban interface is what the technical term is called where homes are intermingled with veget wildland vegetation. We have, to, we have to do something and we either manage the fuel or manage how the homes are built. We, I've been out, Jim and I have come here a f couple times and we did some, some uh, big assessments in 2017 and the board and the fire department have those assessments. But you can, this is something from the Southern Wildfire Risk Assessment Program. I don't know how it works. I know how to push the buttons to get input, to get results. But the, the, some very smart scientists looked at fire history, vegetation patterns, topography, weather patterns. And this is kind of a, a, an outlaying, an expected. It's not fact, it's expected of where we expect fires to occur based on history and historic ignitions and the way the fuels are today. So here's the outline of your community and you had some, you have some ignition areas in here. This is out probably in Catoosa and then a lot of ignitions over here. Potential, potential, okay? So there's a potential for fires to impact the community, okay? But what you guys are recognizing that and taking steps, that's a good thing. This is by all means not a gloom and doom map, okay? Don't take it as that. It's just illustrating there's a potential for ignitions to be in these areas. Okay? Fire adapted communities, okay? That's been a whole array of government agencies and scientific think groups, I guess is what you call it, have come together to identify behaviors and programs to help communities like y'all to take steps to become resilient. Wildfire resilient is the big term, is the term they used, okay? And it's before, to understand your risk and take action before a disaster occurs. That way you're prepared for it. It's just like the fire department trains for, to do their job. The military trains, police departments train. So when a, when a, when a a hazardous situation occurs, they know how to react to it and they know how to do it. While you all can train and you all can take steps beforehand and be prepared. Does that make sense? Whoops. There's some of the programs that they're talking about. We're talking about land management. Catus is doing a lot of man ma land management and I know sometimes their burning gets people jumpy. I understand that. But they're reducing hazard fuels around your community here by a lot of their prescribed burning. Fuel breaks, I don't know that we have any, but there's something you can certainly look at that. Incident response capabilities. I know Chief Smith has mutual aid agreements with neighboring departments, the F Division of Forestry, so in case there is a disaster, it's just not Fairfield Glade. 
trying to, to man, this, man the lines by themselves. They have a, agreements for assistance. And that's something that's very important because no one department can handle it anymore. Things have gotten too complex and, and things happen too quickly. But we have that, the cooperative fire agreement that assists with incident response capabilities. Education, you all are here and that's a good part of it. Education, don't leave it, leave it here. Continue with your education process. Internal safety zones. When we were here a couple years ago, we noticed that there was a, this place is big and if a fire got wind driven fire should occur, it might be hard for everybody to get out. But there's a lot of places where you can take refuge. You just need to designate them and make sure people know about it so you educate. There's a lot of places, good places, where you don't have to have any loss of life here if a disaster were to occur because there's a lot of built-in places. Golf courses don't burn. The big parking lots that you have around here, they don't burn. So you designate those and have escape routes going to these places. Okay, that's some of the things we talk about. Wildfire prevention, that's one of the things the Division of Forestry is very, very intent on. We, we want to min minimize unwanted fires. We can help with debris burning. Of the preponderance of the burn, the, the fires that occur in Tennessee occur because of careless debris burning. I don't think you allow debris burning here in Fairfield Glade, but it's, if you, it's something to be very minimal. Okay, fireworks. I know fireworks probably aren't used here, but campfires. Assisting the public education. We'll come out anytime you ask. We can come out and talk about whatever all you all need. They do school programs. They love school programs, right, Jim? Yes. Children, children will influence their parents very much when they come home from school and say, they talked about us, about fire, being fire safe. Why don't we have an evacuation plan, mom or dad? Okay, they will influence that and they will drive us to action. Ready, set, go. This is, this is a program offered by the International Association of Fire Chiefs and I bring that for the fire departments. We recommend that, we highly recommend the fire departments participate. It gives the fire departments tools to help improve dialogue with y'all, teaching them how to get the message out to mitigate, understand, and respond to different incidents, disasters. Okay? Oh, it's based on the wildland urban interface, but you can apply it to tornadoes, ice storms, wind storms. You can apply it to however, and they, it's free. Everything we're talking about today is free. There's no charge to anybody here. Tenants with the ready, set, go is be prepared. Be ready. Understand what's going on around you. If there's fires going on in the area, have that information available. Have a place where you all can get up-to-date information so you're prepared. You have situational awareness. And then if you have to, if it looks like you might be asked to leave, be set. Have, have things that you need to take with you. If you need medicine with you, have your medicine. Have provisions for pets. Your children, if you have children or grandkids visiting, have that stuff ready. Your important papers, have that ready, okay? Know when, it, know when that time frame might be. When is fire season here in the south? It's in the spring months and it's in the fall before the rains and the snows hit. And that's the way, that way every year. Usually not the summer until it gets really dry at the end of summer. And if we have to, if you're asked to move, to leave, Go early. You don't want to cause a traffic jam while a fire department is trying to get in with their engines or forestry is trying to get in with dozers. An example of that, a tragic example occurred in Ventura County in California about 15 years ago. Some people didn't leave and then when they did leave they panicked and they left their vehicles blocking the only way out. And a Ventura County engine was trying to get, make an escape going up that road well, these vehicles blocked their road and they got overran by the fire. If you have to go, go early and, let, and have, be prepared to do so. Ready, Set, Go program offers community education grants as well. 
That's something to help with your education processes. And this is free, and if the Fairfield Glade Fire Department hasn't enrolled in it, I recommend that you do. I'm going to talk about Firewise USA and how it, you can probably interface to your program that you're doing here, but it's cooperative, multi-agency, state foresters, National Fire Protection Agency, International Association of Fire Chiefs, U.S. Forest Service funds a lot of it, Bureau of Land Management. There's a lot of different agencies that deal with the wildland fire issues that are part of this. It's used to teach people how to adapt to living with wildfire. Okay? There's things that we teach that, and, and you've gotten a good head start on it, but think simple things to do to prepare your homes and prepare your families to be able to deal with a wildfire. The goal is, is that you never have to leave your home because you get be able to manipulate the fuels around you and you harden your home so that it's not going to get taken down by a wildfire. It's a lofty goal, but it's certainly, certainly reachable. And it's community-based. You decide how you want to apply it. The Division of Forestry, we can come and act as advisors, and we'll come as often as you want, and when you get to the point where you've got it under control, we'll leave you alone. Creating defensible space. Does anybody understand what that is, defensible space? That's the separation, that's the space around your home where it's, def it's, def it's your defense zone. You're separating your home 30 feet from flames, okay? It's not that far. It's from me to not even to the end of the building, the end of the room, okay? We're looking for a 30 foot separation from potential flame links around your home. And then if you have, a f that will keep a fire from advancing onto your property and then, uh, Schuler was talking about, when we were chatting earlier, if a home should catch fire, it's not going to spread from the property to threaten other homes. So it works in reverse as well. Property values. If you're reducing your risk, your property value is going to go up. If you have a safer home, it's going to be more valuable than one that's all, all overrun with vegetation. <laughs> Leaves and needles and sticks are in the gutter. Who's going to want to look at that? Community relations with Chief Smith is very, very proactive here, and he'll, he's wanting to, wanting to work with you all. So that will improve relationships within the fire department and that the police department's here too. I commend them for being here. That's great that they're part of this group. That way, when, if you develop evacuation plans, that's who's going to run it, the police department. They're the ones that can say we need to leave, and they're, they're, that that dialogue is right there up front and everybody understands. Evacuations are hard to do. They're very hard to do and nobody wants to do it. Nobody wants to have to order an evacuation because of the hardships it, it puts on to the people that have to leave. But if it's something that has to be done, be knowing, how, knowing why and how up front makes it a little bit easier to swallow. Knowing, knowing what it takes to come back to your homes and what has to be done. So the more you can all dialogue through these programs, the more effective it is. Does that make sense to everybody? And you're all working together. It builds, it strengthens your community. Because it's, it's just some work that needs to be done, and it's much easier if everybody pitches in, and everybody does a little bit, and then the community benefits as a whole a lot, a lot larger benefit. Currently, there are 35 recognized Firewise communities in Tennessee, and we have several more that are, that are working through the process. But just uh, five years ago, we only had 18, so we've almost doubled in about five years. There are insurance benefits that go along with becoming a recognized Firewise USA site. Okay, it's not direct, although in some states it is, where USAA gives a 10% discount to recognized Firewise USA communities, but an indirect is ready, set, go, one less spark, Firewise USA. These are